Okay, amazing. Wonderful to be with you all today. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to say yes to you because that is what this is all about. For anyone who doesn't know me, I am your host today, Nicole Mixdorf, and I am the founder and chief wellness officer at Balance by Nature. And today I have a very, very special guest that I'm so excited to introduce you all to. Uh, Sarah Davidson is a globally recognized multi-award winning divorce coach, a twice best-selling author, a podcaster, and a coach trainer with over 26 years of experience helping people navigate the complexities of breakups and divorce. Known as the Divorce Coach, Sarah is a leading expert in her field with a client list that includes celebrities, politicians, and elite athletes. Having experienced her own marriage breakdown, she created a powerful toolkit of practical techniques and strategies to help others manage the emotional challenges of separation and move forward with confidence. As the founder of the International Divorce Coach Center of Excellence, Sarah has trained a global community of over 600 and 50 breakup and divorce coaches across 17 countries and five continents. Wow, like that's so amazing. She's also the creator of the Heartbreak to Happiness online support groups, which provide vital resources to individuals coping with breakups worldwide. As a passionate advocate for domestic abuse survivors, Sarah serves as a patron for a domestic abuse charity and regularly shares her expertise through media appearances, including TV, radio, and print outlets all over the world. With her empathetic and holistic approach, Sarah empowers individuals to take back control of their lives, rebuild their self-worth, and create a brighter future post-divorce. Amazing. Oh my goodness. Thank you so, so much, Sarah, for taking the time to be with us today. Oh, well, I'm super excited. I love chatting with you. We've had some amazing chats in the past, and I'm really excited to be here. So thanks so much for having me as your guest. Absolutely. So, so excited to have you here. So let's just dive in. One of the topics that I found so interesting that you really dive into a lot now is the impact of breakups and divorce in the workplace. So mm -hmm. from your extensive experience, Sarah, how big of an issue um, do divorce and breakups tend to be in the workplace? And what kind of an impact do you see on individuals' performance, mental health, and overall well-being at work? Well, it's such a great question because until two years ago, nobody was really talking about the impact right. of breakup, divorce, or domestic abuse in the workplace. Yeah. And, but since two years ago, it's something that I literally spend most of my time talking about now, which is great. It's great yeah. because uh, anyone who's listening who's been through a divorce will know that it impacts your ability to do everything. It doesn't right. just break down the relationship, which is where we tend to think, oh, well, you know, they're going through a relationship breakdown. They're going to yeah. be sad, go through different emotions. This is something that has a ripple effect across your entire life, including yeah. your ability to parent, your mental health, your physical health, and especially your ability to work. Yeah. And the stats show, and I think Harvard Business Journal came up with quite a few different interesting stats around this. But I think the most shocking one that most people don't realize is that it reduces your productivity in the workplace up to 40%, 40 percent, wow. 40 percent. Yeah. And that is not just for the year of the breakup either. It's for three years. It's, it's the wow. year before the breakup. Yeah, when everything's falling apart and you're trying to work things sense. out. Yeah. Then the year as you're separating and maybe going through the actual divorce or breakup process. And then the year after as you're getting used to new childcare arrangements, living arrangements, financial arrangements. Again, mm. it has a huge impact. And then they went further to say it doesn't just impact that individual. And I think we all know this. It also it impacts the people around them negatively mm. in the workplace. So that can reduce productivity up to 5% for co-workers and line managers. Yeah. So if you think about that, plus 9 out of 10 said they had taken days off because of this as well. I mean, the, the implications on the business, not only the mental well-being of the team, yeah. But actually the bottom line as well, when people aren't showing up, they're off sick, they're having to take days for court, they're making 
bad decisions or they can't focus. They're very emotional at work. They're bringing the morale of the whole team down as well. Not intentionally. It's a really tough time. But, right. you know, a lot of people will feel sorry for them or want to support them. And again, this might take them away from doing their job. So, yeah, it's a, it has a massive impact on the workplace. And I think, um, you know, being able to help people and support people through that is really, really key. That makes perfect sense. You know, we talk a lot about how to support the mental well-being of employees, and it goes beyond just your physical well-being. You know, we really talk in, in a balance by nature about these 10 pillars of wholeness and your social wholeness, your relationships, that's an entire pillar and all of them affect each other. So whatever you've got going on in your life is going to come with you when you sit down to work. But it's really insightful what you've shared that this can impact people's performance their productivity by 40% for three years in a row. I mean, that's really amazing. So Sarah, how do you support organizations or what suggestions would you have for an organization or benefits teams that really want to help their employees um, get through this time in their lives so that they can minimize the, the negative impact at the workplace? Yeah, I mean, there's good news. And that is that there's lots of things you can do to help them. First of all, just being aware. Now, obviously, people in the well-being teams and HR tend to be highly empathetic, really lovely people. And yeah. I was speaking at an HR conference and people might be able to pick up on my accent. I'm British. I live in the UK in London. Um, and I was speaking at a conference over here the other day and an HR director put her hand up. She said, Sarah, I've got a question. She said, I've I've got a guy and he's going through a divorce in my team and he comes in every morning and he's very sweet because he comes in, he brings me a cup of coffee every morning and he comes into my office and we start the day where he downloads what's happened the previous evening and the latest update. He was, you know, nine months in, I think, to his divorce, she said. Um, she said, but I just got a question for you. She goes, I can listen. I'm being empathetic. We're really, the whole team are trying to support him. And he comes in my room for 20 minutes. Then I watch him working his way around the whole office. And then eventually he sits down. And what I'm thinking is, you know, we're being really kind. We're being very supportive. But when is he going to get over this? Because it's really having quite a negative impact. Right. And so I was talking to her about, look, it's all, it's, it is obviously you want to be reassuring, you want to be empathetic. She was doing a lot of the right things, but it does get to a point where, you know, friends, family, maybe HR teams and other employees can enable the individual to stay stuck. Because if you're yeah. enabling them to talk to you and download their story, they're getting love and connection from that. And we've got to remember that that's what they've lost from their partner in most cases. They've lost that right. love and connection. So they're looking for that from other sources. And we can get that from other sources. It's our number one human need. So we sure. will definitely find it from other sources, whether it's a colleague or someone at home or even a dog, we will find that love and connection and we will seek it out, right? So it's really important to us. But in some cases, like this example, we're connecting to get that love and connection on quite a negative frame. Right. What we want to do is empower people in HR teams and, and maybe the mental health first aiders, benefits teams, to be able to flip that and say, okay, we, we want to support you and we're here for you. Send them to a specialist coach or somebody that can fast track that recovery. But their role in the office is to get them focused on moving forward. Mm -hmm. So taking their power back and then focusing on the project of, right, What's going to happen that's going to help you move forward from this? Not let's focus on what's happened on the story, looking in the rear view mirror that's keeping you stuck. So you can still give them that love and connection, but it's moving forward. So it's like, hey, did you manage to get down to that social club? Or did you manage to you mm -hmm. know, sit down last night and do that project? Or did you tick off that thing off your list that your coach gave you the other day? It's encouragement and support, but it's very much focused on moving forward. That's a very different kind of support. And that's, especially at nine months, that's definitely where that, that guy needed to be so that he could swap that sort of reinforcement of his situation with a propelling support to move him forward. So it's looking for things like that, but also in the workplace, giving people time out if they are getting emotional, like saying, look, we understand right now, you're going through a tough emotional time. You know, there are going to be tears. It is part of the grieving process. 
Yeah. Most people don't even know that that actually divorce is the second most traumatic life experience we go through after death of a loved one. Mm. So it follows the same loss cycle. So you're going through that whole grieving process, grieving the end of that relationship. Oftentimes, whether it's your choice or it wasn't your choice, you still go through that process. So, you know, crying and being upset is part of it. So actually saying it's okay and we'll help you with that and you can take time out and you can just, you know, we'll create a space in the office where you can go, no one's going to come up, you get a bit of time out and then you can come back in. So it's setting things up around the office so that they have a space where they can go, that they can kind of get through that moment and then come back. And hopefully if they are working with a specialist coach, they'll be giving them the coping mechanisms to fast track that. That's the key, fast tracking it. And learning a toolkit that of self-empowerment tools. So you're not dependent on your average coping mechanisms, drinking, partying, maybe right. throwing yourself to work or even throwing yourself into the gym. They sound healthy, but it's a very much a distraction or what I call stuffing process, stuffing those emotions down. They're going to come back up at difficult times when you're challenged in other areas. So we want to make sure they've got those healthy coping mechanisms and you can support those in the workplace too. I love that. So what kind do you have a few examples you can share about some healthy coping mechanisms that that you offer to some of your clients that are going through this that might be listening today? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's so many different things. And the interesting thing with this is that there's no one size fits all. So you will all have friends. I mean, I had a funny story the other day. Uh, like some of us can cope with quite a lot of stress and carry yeah. on. And and that's kind of, yeah, you might be paddling madly like a swan under the water, but everything seems to be okay. And some of those friends that we know can take on a bit more stress than others. Now right. I've, I was in our supermarket, just local one the other day. And one of my friends came in and she was in an absolute mess. She was beside herself. Um, and I was like, Ali, are you okay? She's like, no, I'm not Okay. And I was like, oh my goodness. And she looked so upset. I was stopped my shopping. I was like, what's going on? And she said, my daughter is going to the airport this afternoon and we didn't have enough food in the house to make her lunch. So I've had to come out and now I'm running around trying to get her lunch because she's going to be leaving soon. I literally stood there with my mouth open. Is that all that's going on? Because if I was demonstrating the symptoms that you've been like walking around looking like you're crying, there would be something really serious going on. And to me, I don't quite know how you get through the day, Ali, if this has thrown you off kilter so badly. So this is how it works with clients. Some clients can cope with a huge amount of stress and others have a very low threshold for anything Mm -hmm. that takes them out of their everyday routine. So again, this is why we have to look at the individual on their own and say, okay, let's build up a support mechanism that works for you. So for Ali in that stage, yeah, that's quite extreme uh, example, but we do see clients who are really in that panic, overwhelm, can't process Mm -hmm. at that stage of the game. It really is self-care. Yeah, There aren't any tools to fast track you out of that process. You need to really calm the nerves. You need to reassure. You need to build up what I call your breakup support team so that anything that's worrying you in your head, you have an answer for by having someone on speed dial, whether that's a legal advisor, a really good friend, someone that's good with spreadsheets or budgeting, you know, all the different areas that do worry people. Um, yeah, have someone that can answer those questions on speed dial. So we build up that support team. But then there's other things. It's looking at breaking down what time of day that particular client is struggling. Some Mm. people find it much worse in the morning. People describe it as the tsunami effect where they wake up in the morning and they have that split second of, oh, it's morning. And then it hits them. Mm. Oh, wow. Yeah, I'm dealing with the divorce or the lawyers are coming around or the children are struggling. So that particular client may find it really hard in the morning and then find that hard the impact of getting out of bed, getting into work, that's when they might phone in sick. This is where those trigger points come in really difficult for clients. Mm -hmm. Others find it harder in the evening, which means they may have a coping mechanism, which is going to drinking more or, you know, staying up late or maybe partying or distracting themselves with other things. So Mm -hmm. what we want to do is identify each for that individual. What is their coping mechanism? Is it helping them? Is it not? And then what can we swap it for? Right. Um, big believer that you can't stop doing something without replacing it with something else. So again, that will very much depend on the individual. So yeah, everything is tailored to them, but getting support in place, self-care up front in the early days, 
But then we have a lot of tools which will fast track things a lot faster if they're more through that sort of overwhelm, shock and denial stage. And then more into the stage where they're like, I really need some help just to power me through. Tell me what to do. And we create action plans specific to that individual that will help them tick off a list in between sessions, which we find really helps maintain that momentum. So they're constantly making progress, which is why we get those fast transformations and people performing again really quickly because we're giving them that safety net and the ability to change how they feel. Right. Most people think if something bad happens, then they're stuck with it. And actually, yes, bad things happen. And I'm not negating how bad some of these things are. The stories we hear can be pretty tough, sure. but actually knowing that they can change how they feel and yeah. we've got specific tools to help them dial down those negative emotions, that really gives people the ability to go, right, I'm struggling right now. Let me put some of these tools into action so I can focus. And then they know they've got that support if they need it. That's amazing. And I love that you offer this really specialized support because I would imagine that most people may not even know that divorce coaching is even a thing and they're leaning into their therapist and that's not bad either. You know, that's good support, but this is a little bit different. Can you talk a little bit about the difference between somebody uh, going to therapy for this type of support versus the type of support that your team offers them? Yeah. Now, obviously there's some amazing therapists sure. and I find that very helpful if you've got specific issues around breakup or divorce. So for example, if you're divorcing an addict, or mm. you really want to understand some of the psychological issues, or maybe you struggle with trauma in childhood and you're working through some of those things. So they play a really important role. What I find works well with coaching is that we are much more directive. Yeah. So we actually create that tailored action plan for each individual. We can make suggestions. We can bring in different tools and techniques to make those almost instant changes because you can change how you feel in a heartbeat with some of these tools. So clients will often come in and, well, every session we end on a high, we give them, a, if it's not just hope, it's also a plan of action. And we notice how people shift very quickly with some of the tools. So it is it is more about getting those light bulb moments understanding gosh I do do that a lot of our coaching is shining a light on unconscious behavior and right. making it more conscious because it's unconscious behaviors that we learn right from childhood mm -hmm. like we learn how to resolve conflict I'm working with this amazing woman at the moment but when she was a child her conflict uh when, when she got into conflict with her dad she learned the best way to survive was just to go quiet it wasn't to stand right. up for herself. It wasn't even to have any kind of voice. It was to be quiet and remove herself and go to her room. Now, she learned that unconsciously as a child, and that's the coping strategy she's taken through into adulthood today. Now, yeah. in some cases, that is that serves her well and keeps her safe. But in other cases, that's not working so well for her. So it's looking at right. what strategies have we adopted from childhood that we're still using that might actually be keeping us stuck. Once clients are consciously aware, that's when we as coaches can go in and create some shifts and some changes. We can then start to be quite directive, suggest some ideas. We unpack all the options as well. We look at yeah. all the things that they could do, all the different avenues and ways, even ways they may be resistant to, or even ways that maybe they haven't thought about. And then we look at them all. Now we never tell our clients what to do, but we're, we can make suggestions, get their agreement, and not just, you know, the action plan isn't a list of homework. We dive deep so they don't have to do any work to achieve them. So I always say to my coaches when I'm training them, imagine it almost like a, a football pitch and you start at one end and the goal is down the other. And you're with your client and you're kicking the ball backwards and forwards between each other discussing, okay, so you want to do some exercise. Okay, well, we're not going to just put exercise on your action plan. I'm going to look at what exercise um, and when would you do it? And how would you get there? And what would that look like? And what do you need maybe in your car so that it's ready for that next day? And where and how and when? So actually on the action plan, they take the ball all the way down to the goal line, leave it on the goal line. So all the client has to do in between sessions is just give it the tiniest tap and they've scored yeah. a goal and achieved something, they've moved forward. So that's how we work with clients. So that's how we tip the balance to really achieving those transformations pretty quick and enabling people with quite simple tools to use to get those changes like implemented in their life and set in there so they can start practicing and building up that muscle 
it's self-empowerment. So they're not dependent on us as coaches. We work very much faster in most cases than therapists or counselors. And we are definitely a lot more directive. So for people that like so a practical solution focused, results focused style of, of working, they love what we do. So that's why it's quite different. Yeah, that's amazing. I really appreciate that approach that you take with them because I find that offering those suggestions and coaching someone through it is very different than just being a sounding board to listen. And it's important for them to have someone to listen and the coach can listen as well, but to be able to offer them those those plans and suggestions and how are we going to make this easy for you so that you can just do this in a simple way that doesn't feel like you're having to take on so many more things and where do I fit this in and all of that on their own. It's like you're taking all that hard part of it out of the equation and just allowing them to um, to get those quick wins fast, which I think is really the key um, and, the, and just kind of the magic, honestly, and what yeah. you're doing. Because I know for myself, I've had friends and colleagues that have gone through divorce and you know, one woman I'm just is coming to my mind, like it would dragged out for eight years, you know, yeah. it was a long, long time. And she was a train wreck the entire mm -hmm time that that was happening and she's finally on the other side of it now but i thought wow as you're talking what a gift truly it is to help somebody fast track that and get through this really difficult painful experience that they're going through um which is greater clarity and greater ease so yeah, yeah. so Sarah, think, go ahead i was just going to pick up on a point you said i think you're spot on i think a lot of people um want to be listened to um, as well as have the tools so what I think in my bio you you talked about um, our online heartbreaks happiness support group yeah this is something I really wish Nicole I'd had going through my divorce it I looked but I mean the support groups for losing weight and giving up smoking but there was nothing for heartbreak and mm. heartbreak feels like a really physical pain and you really yeah. need someone to say you know a lot of people's Probably the most frequently asked question I get is, when will the heartbreak stop? When will mm -hmm. it end? When, I, when will I start to feel better? And yeah. my answer is always, when you decide, because it gets yes. to the point where you've got that tipping point, <laughs> like, just need to take some action here and shift things. But a lot of people don't know what action to take. So I created these online support groups um, for people because I thought, you know, coming online and actually finding your tribe. You know, yeah, people at work get fed up of hearing the story and family and friends, eight years. I mean, that's a long time you supported her for. I mean, uh, that's a lot. So quite often people need an outside support group of like minded people going through similar but different issues. Sometimes it can give perspective and make you think, gosh, right. my situation isn't quite that bad. But other times just feeling heard and then getting advice from an accredited coach who, who's been there. Most of my coaches have been and they've been on that pain to power journey to sort of transfer, transform, the, you know, all, that, all those tough times into something that now can help people and create them a living as well. So I think that's quite an empowering journey. But for the, for the clients, working with the coaches going, well, you've got through it. This is inspiring. I can do it, too. So, again, I think you're right. People need to be heard, but then sometimes people want a really deep dive and that's where the one-to-one -one coaching can really fast track right. um, because obviously on a group setting, you can't share as, as, as much or get that tailored advice, but you're right. You do need to be heard for sure. Yeah, but I love that you offer both of those solutions because I think a support group is such a powerful way to connect with other people who get it. You know, because yeah. somebody who is going through this kind of experience, especially if their immediate circle have not gone through that, they might feel sort of alone or they might feel that the advice that their friends are giving them isn't relevant because they don't really they don't feel really understood. So having other people that they can connect with and virtually is beautiful because you can kind of do it from anywhere. Yeah. Um I think is such a, a brilliant way to offer some additional support beyond the one-on-one. -on -one. Um, or I could see some starting with the one-on-one -on -one or some starting with the group or doing both, um, that type of thing. But I think that's that's really um, amazing. So I love that you offer that out. And then, um, you know, you've I know, Sarah, that a big part of your background is you've got this big passion for helping people, specifically women that have gone through domestic abuse, um, 
What kind of advice would you have for a woman who is, who's been in an abusive situation, an abusive relationship, and she's getting ready to serve divorce papers to her, her partner who maybe is a narcissist or, you know, obviously has been abusing in some way, shape or form. I've heard that that's really one of the most dangerous times for a woman is like right when they're going to be serving these divorce papers to their partner. What are some strategies you might be able to share for ways that a woman can navigate through that really critical point? Um, as easily as possible while maintaining kind of safety for herself and, and perhaps children um, to possibly maybe avoid, you know, a violent kind of response? Well, I'm glad you're asking these questions because it's something that really needs to be talked about and we really yeah. need to shine a light on these. And what I find is quite often the advice from the legal advice is, is completely dangerous, actually, to be honest. Interesting. Um, okay. Yeah. I mean, I can't tell you the number of times people said, oh, the sooner you get out of there, the better. I was told, you know, once you get, you know, now you're out, things will be better. Mm. Post-separation abuse is one of the biggest misunderstood issues that we have. And this is a global thing. And also the stats reflect, um, and this is globally as well, that I think it's about the same in the States as it is in the UK and in Australia. It's kind of like the, the stat around the world. It's about 30% of homicides happen within three months of separation wow over, yeah but the, i find the most chilling part of this is that over 80 percent of those homicides over 80 percent there was never any physical violence before wow yeah so yeah. what we what we are learning and we you know those of us that are sort of campaigning on the on the front for it for better sort of understanding of this in the family court systems is that this is a very dangerous period of time Right. So if you are thinking about leaving an abuser, you really do need to get your ducks in a row first okay. before you react. Now, I know that you want to get out of that scenario and it takes on average eight times for a victim of abuse to leave an abuser because they're so good at what's called hoovering us back into those relationships. And I speak as a survivor myself. So what happens is some of us like me were catapulted out of my marriage. I had no choice. So I found out overnight that my ex, my, my ex was not only didn't want to be married to me anymore, but he was madly in love in some, with somebody else and had been oh. having it there for a relatively long time, six, seven months that I know of. Um, and not only that, um, <laughs> I found she was 12 years younger, Nicole, which never helps, I can tell you. Stunningly beautiful. Again, that never helps. But also I found out within a couple of weeks that she was pregnant. Oh my um, goodness. Yeah. My son was only one at the time. Um, and we had a global business together as well. So we had almost 200 staff. We had an office in London, office in Sydney, Australia. Oh a lot of people knew about this other person. Um, and as people do, you know, when the truth came out, they knew I knew they started coming forward and telling me their story. So the pain just went on and on and on and on. Oh, wow. Um I was like, okay, I don't need to know what they did when you found out. I just, it's just painful. So going yeah. through that kind of, like, I've been through it. And I think, you know, I didn't realize how toxic my relationship was till I was outside of it. Wow. Now, a lot of people don't. We have to minimize and normalize to stay in a certain environment. And mm. also often we're told it's our fault. We're not good enough. And because our confidence and our self-esteem has been massively eroded, and I'm nothing like the person I was then. I've sort of built myself back up since then, back to who I was before I met him. But ultimately, you know, our confidence is so dense, we think it's us. So going back to your question, if you are going through that, you really need to be careful. I would definitely check, um, get some support from your local domestic abuse charity. Um, mm. There are, are charities that will give you advice and do risk assessments for you and work out how that, that's going to happen. Um if you are at risk of violence, this is really important. Um, I was working with someone the other day who said, right, I'm going to leave. I'm going to take the kids to my friend's house. I'm slowly taking, you know, bits and bobs over there so that he he doesn't he doesn't notice suddenly everything's gone or things have right. changed. But photocopying really important documents like mm. passports, taking those and or getting copies of them and things that you really need, important like birth certificates of the children, things like that. So again, she was preparing all this stuff on the advice of the charity she'd been working with as well. Um, but her plan was then to go back and tell him face to face. 
no, this is definitely something I wouldn't recommend. Um, yeah. In that case, in that scenario, there have been violence before, but even if there hasn't, I, I really wouldn't recommend that. So yeah. again, every case is different. Every scenario is different. Every perpetrator yeah. is different. And you will know your, I call them pet psychos, better than anyone else. So listen to your instinct. That's one of the things that we lose when we come out of a toxic relationship because mm. we've learned that we're, you know, it's, you know, you're always wrong. You're never right. So you stop trusting your instincts. So rebuilding that is part of the work that we do. The other thing is with post-separation abuse, even if they're, you know, even if you move apart and there is no physical threat, for example, but you won't know that because, as I said, over 80 percent never had um, any violence. But as you pull away, their need for control increases. And and it and it's harder for them to control you, so they have to step up their game in some way, which is why the violence can take over, as they get more desperate to pull you back in. Now it's not in all cases, so I don't want to freak everyone out, but no. this is what we see, and the stats reflect this. So we really have to take it very seriously. So my advice was would be to get some specialist advice. Obviously, domestic abuse charity can give you that. My coaches are trained in that as well. Um, mm. We are the only global providers of domestic abuse coaching support for in the workplace. So that's something that we do a lot of. Um, and we're actually working with the UK government as well to provide that. Um, so we do work with you know, lots of different companies. But the other thing is post-separation abuse, again, is very misunderstood because people think, well, when I've left, things are going to get easier. Right. Actually, my law she said that to me she said oh Sarah now you're not living with him anymore life's going to get back to normal it'll be great and the abuse will stop that doesn't happen because mm. all the confusing behavior the gaslighting the manipulative behavior the confusing hold withholding information all that now has to be channeled into the financial settlement and and the children if they're children right so what happens is you get the letters that are threatening from the lawyers. They become the mouthpiece of abuse, which is one of my biggest bugbears, actually, mm -hmm. with the family court system. Um, also, the, the the threats are there through the, through the legal letters. The wording can be very aggressive. But also, it's that they, they don't send information in on time. They keep you waiting. They give you, send you confusing information. They don't reply, or when they do reply, it doesn't make sense. Or they throw another grenade into the situation, which is irrelevant to what you're dealing with, but it's designed to distract you. Also run up extremely high legal bills if you've got a lawyer that doesn't understand and is chasing these different grenades down different rabbit holes, okay. running up bills. So again, we've got to be really... Um, aware of how that post-separation abuse come flow through the divorce process and how emotionally it can be a huge thing and financially extremely devastating as well so again the and then the child arrangements using the children is a very obvious way um and i work with women we also work with men there are men that are dealing with not being able to see their kids because women are withholding access so there's lots of different sides to this but the family court system is really not fit for purpose and they don't understand domestic abuse, whether people want to think that it's lack of education or willful ignorance, whatever your choice. I know what I think, but I know that there are some good people in the system that are trying to change it, but are not enough. So we're not seeing those changes. And 80 percent of victims of abuse who go through the family court system here in, UK, in the UK report that they were re-traumatized by the court system and the professionals in it, not wow. their ex. I mean, their ex was doing it as well, but, you know, through they would be traumatized by the process. And that's not OK. And that's where my coaches and I come in and we spend our days picking those people up and rebuilding them because they you can take your power back, even with an extremely controlling abuser. You can yeah. navigate your way through. There is a lot of hope. I've developed specific tools and techniques that will help you to do that and protect your kids as, as well emotionally and, and teach them in a safe way what's going on so they understand age appropriate. And so in, in some cases where it's safe to do so, they can still maintain a healthy relationship with that parent because that's obviously better for them if it's safe for them. And then we navigate that journey moving forward. So yeah, it's good to have somebody that really gets it on board, but be careful, be careful. Don't rush into anything would be my advice. Wow, that's really powerful, Sarah, because I know somebody who is in that exact situation right now where the husband is, um, you know, a belligerent drunk and it's become such a huge problem. And she's so scared and not sure how to go about, you know, 
starting this divorce process. She's already worked with her lawyers and all of this because she's so afraid. And, you know, in the U.S., um, a lot of people own guns and they they have several in the house. And so yeah. that really terrifies her. And she just doesn't even know. It's almost like it creates freeze, right? And you're not even sure what to do and, and how do you keep them safe, especially in that really critical beginning phase stage. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, all these things are very difficult issues. I mean, obviously, I would say if you think you're in imminent danger, call the police and make sure that you're safe. Yeah. Um, also, you can be on the high alert list. If you go to a domestic abuse charity, they will do a risk assessment. They will look at those things and they will be able to give you the best advice for your community, the different services, right. put different services on red alert. If they did get a phone call, set up some sort of protocol for you. So I definitely recommend doing that if that is the kind of situation you're in, because this, these decisions you can't you can't take lightly. You've really got to think them through. Just getting out, I know that's the goal, um, yeah. and that's what we ideally want. But we've got to make sure the plan is uh, as safe as we can possibly make it. Yeah. So it sounds like there's a lot of pre-planning that is really key to trying to make this as smoother and easy a process as possible. So it sounds like um, even working with a coach uh, at, at this early stage before you even go through the actual divorce process is really powerful because it can help somebody get clear on what does the process, what's the process really going to be? What is this going to look like? What are things that you can expect or anticipate happening? How can you set yourself up for success in a better way? Um, right, right out of the gate, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And also you, you talked about clarity and, and clarity is really important. And so a lot of the work we do in the initial phase with clients is educate them on what abuse is. Because people will have their own understanding of it. And if you've been on the internet Googling narcissism, you'll have your own sort of opinions. And a lot of that isn't actually factually correct and, and can be misleading and can actually inflame a lot of situations. So what we want to do is give you the facts. Um, all Everything we do is, is um, all the training we do is, is accredited by a domestic abuse charity in the UK. So we know we're giving you the facts as they are from a regulated domestic abuse charity. Um, and we want to give you the information that really helps keep you safe by increasing your clarity, which gives you power. If you mm. understand what you're in, and, and it is a game, whether you like that term or not, we've got to get comfortable with the fact that you are like a pawn being moved around. And unless you learn the rules of the game, master them then you can be two steps ahead this is how we work with people like this that are playing mind games and tricks with us all the time right. so it's about learning to what i call hone your radar to spot the signs of abuse that's when you can start to take some of your power back safely we're not telling the perpetrator any of this by the way this is all happening behind closed doors right. but getting the education so you understand you can see ah okay they're doing this which is a tactic because they're all doing the same they're all working from the same the same book it's not we think they're genius or it's super confusing yeah. but actually if you distill it down they all use the same tactics your pet psycho you'll know which ones they prefer to others potentially but you'll have an understanding of the game then you could be two steps ahead then you're not yeah. re uh, reacting emotionally that's how you get your power back because you're like okay i'm seeing it for what it is i'm not diving down those rabbit warrens anymore so by right. holding your radar before you even get to taking action to leave or do anything really puts you in a much stronger position so it's that education part first and then it's the planning part and then it's like right how do we keep you safe but a lot of that will be done with the local authorities as well that makes a lot of sense and yeah. then do you have any like advice or suggestions for parents that you know, are going through this process right now and they may have to co-parent with the person who might be a narcissist or, you know, one of those types of people that you're talking about. Um, I can only imagine that that would be an extraordinarily difficult situation, not just for you personally, but also for the children. So how, what kind of strategies would you have for how to, kind of navigate that with your kids? Um, maybe Is it communication strategies or, or what kinds of things can you do to help kids sort of feel safe through this big life transition for them? Yeah, I mean, when we're talking about co-parenting, if you, I mean, obviously co-parenting is a great way forward if both parents are healthy and they right. you know, both painful out. If you have one unhealthy parent, toxic, abusive, you cannot co-parent, you mm. cannot. 
is impossible because if mm. you tell them the idea of co-parenting is that you compromise so you're saying right okay well you may let them go to bed slightly later but that's okay yeah i'm not going to fight about the big things we'll compromise on 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 on, this, on those things and we'll just worry about the big important things the small things we'll let go how much screen yeah. time you know how orange your shirt is at the end of the day we can relax about that we're going to make big decisions we'll do that together that's all about compromise now, the challenge you have with an abuser is there is no compromise. It's right. all about causing maximum pain and suffering and ultimately total oh. annihilation for the victim of abuse. Oh. So also this whole rubbish that people talk about that, oh, well, they're abusive to the mother or the, or the father, but they're not abusive to the children. Mm. That's, that is in, that's not a thing. OK, so let's just dispel that myth right out, because if you're, abu if you're an abuser, you're abusive to everyone in your circle. Now, mm. being abusive, interesting, doesn't mean being nasty to everyone. It means being able to manipulate people to Definitely. get what you want. So for some of people, they may see them as extremely charming. Mm -hmm. as like, oh, always life and soul, very accommodating, very generous, life mm -hmm. and soul even. But then, you know, for the victim of abuse, that will, that will manifest in a very different way. But you, any, everyone can see the dark side of that person at some point if they're not in line and they don't do what they want them to do. That's why they don't have friendships going back very long because people ultimately see them for who they are if things don't go well. Because all friendships are based on compromise. You know, you know, I love my best friend, but sometimes we don't see eye to eye, but we compromise. That's a healthy right. dynamic. If you have children in the mix, this is where it becomes very difficult because obviously for children, it is better if they have a, a relationship with the other parent. Okay. Right. Only if it's safe for them to do so. We're not talking about, you know, if they're being, a, a, you know, there's some sorts of abuse, which are very difficult. And obviously we don't want to, we don't want that around the kids. So they have to be safe. But the challenge at the moment is proving some of the things that are happening. And is coercive control safe? I don't know. There's a whole debate on these different things about, you know, what is safe? Emotional abuse is can be just as scarring and damaging as physical yeah. abuse, abuse. There's all sorts of things. I'm not that you can't compare one to the other. They're all horrendous and very, very difficult to live with and cause lifelong trauma. Yeah. However, in an ideal situation, we would like to say if the kids are safe, they should have some relationships. So they don't feel rejected or abandoned and they don't have those challenges to deal with as they grow up. So the challenge we also have is that children will go usually one of three ways. They'll either learn to be the abuser because they see that's probably the most effective way sure. to survive. They don't want to be the victim. They've seen what happens to them. They will learn what because they they will learn to be the victim because they're constantly walking on eggshells, so they're over compromising and being hyper vigilant all the time. And they learn that that's how they are. In which case, uh, as they grow older, quite often these these children will want relationships that mm -hmm. are familiar because familiarity. Yeah in a weird way, feels safe, ironically. Yeah. It's not safe. They're repeating the pattern that they know. So that's that. That's that. And in a small uh, minority of cases, and um, ideally what we want is the child to be able to spot what the abuse is and not want anything to do with it, but be able to see past that to navigate a, a healthy, as far as can be healthy relationship with that abuser. So they understand the lies and the gaslighting. They're not buying into it. They don't have anything to do with that, but they can still maintain a relationship at some on some level with them, which is ideal in, in these kind of scenarios if it's safe for them to do so. So again, that is going to come down to, do you have a healthy parent, right. the other parent, who can understand these tools in order to empower you? And I'm a very big believer and quite controversial in the media, I suppose, in some ways, that I don't believe divorce has to damage kids. And as long as kids have one healthy parent, this can actually be a very valuable life lesson. And yes. you know, whether we're working with employees in the workplace or consumers coming to us direct or on our group sessions, this is how we help our clients to empower their kids. Because if they can learn to hone their radar, spot the signs of abuse right. at a young age, they are not gonna make the same mistakes that some of us made as we got older. So again, it can be valuable and it can actually save a lot of pain and heartache in, in, in later years. And there are some studies that are, that are done that show that children who have suffered some form of adversity, not extreme poverty or, or extreme abuse, but some form of adversity growing up, actually go on to be happier because they make better decisions about who they surround themselves with. And obviously a lot of our happiness and success in life comes on the people that we connect with. 
Yeah. Um, so again, a lot of these things, you know, it's not, yeah, there is hope. There's some good stuff there. And that's why, you know, I do go into companies and do trainings on how to spot the signs of abuse um, and how to spot the signs of abuse with employees, because it's very hard to spot anyway abuse. Because unless you're turning up with a black eye or a burn or right. a broken arm or whatever, it's very hard to spot because it could be controlling behavior about yeah. finances, about what they wear, who they talk to in the workplace, what time they come home. And mm -hmm. if they're invited to social events, are they different around their ex? And if their ex is there, are they the life and soul? Yeah, they, there's a lot of things that you know, are misread. Sometimes people I had a client the other day. She didn't want to go into work because her husband had damaged her laptop and she knew she was going to be in trouble, but oh. she couldn't she couldn't do that. I had another client who, whose uh, partner kept disabling the car so that she couldn't get to work. And so she was getting told off of being late. They didn't understand that actually it was the abuse that was stopping her getting there. It wasn't that she didn't want to be there. So right. you can see how there can be signs that you would misread as an employer yeah. Because you're like, well, you're late every day. This is not okay. And they're, and, and they're not going to say, yes, I'm being abused by my husband. In a lot of cases, that's not going to be how they're going to, how it's going to come out. So again, having the anonymous support that they can contact an expert or a support system like us means that they can come to us anonymously. We can right. help them with that. And even the employee might not even realize that that person is going through it. So anonymity in these cases can actually be really helpful but in cases where they have a good relationship with their HR department and can say things, it, it can be quite difficult for the HR department because tend to be the yeah. empathetic, kind people who want to listen. But how do you deal with all that? That's a lot for your average person to take on who's not trained in managing that. And a lot of what we do with coaches, I train them on self-care, how to process this information so it doesn't stick with them in the way that it would if you hadn't managed, hadn't been trained how to manage it. So there's a lot to it. There's a lot to this, but um, I'm I'm very grateful that you're giving me the opportunity to to shine a light on why it's needed, and in some cases why it saves lives. It's super important. Yeah, absolutely, and it's amazing. And the fact that this is such a huge issue in the workplace, and it affects so many people, um, it just it, it makes it so relevant. And I love that you are offering tools and solutions for organizations to have resources to point people toward because. You know, I work with a lot of organizations and I talk to their benefits teams and I understand their HR teams, what benefits they're offering. And rarely do I see this as an offering. You know, sometimes it's it's counseling and I would imagine they would just refer them to that or their EAP or something like that. But it's not it's not the same as what you're talking about. I mean, this is very specialized services and specialized support from people that are highly trained who've been through something similar. They know exactly what they can, what to do and how to help somebody navigate their way through this emotionally so that, you know, it doesn't have to impact them in such a big way that's going to affect how they show up at work, but also just, you know, helping them to get through it a little bit less, you know, unscathed in some way ways so yeah. that they can get the help that they need because a lot of people don't know what resources are even available for them and they're afraid to ask for help I would imagine yeah. you know there's a lot of uh, a lot of people especially if there is any type of abuse that's happening that are just scared scared to say anything scared to ask for help and so the ability to do something anonymously, I think would be incredibly empowering for somebody, but it's a matter of even knowing that that even exists. And yeah. so bringing that education, you know, into that environment so that people know what is available to them is, is, is huge. I mean, this is yeah. amazing. Uh, we have, we create, because you're spot on, it, it's hard and people are not only scared, but embarrassed. I know I was very embarrassed when I started to realize, gosh, I allowed this in some ways to happen to me. How did I do this? You know, I'm not, I'm not an idiot. Am I? Maybe I am. I was thinking, you know, this is, this happens to everyone all walks of life, you know, and I didn't think it would happen to someone like me, but it did. And mm -hmm. I, you know, I work with many people all from different backgrounds and, you know, it, it does really happen to everyone. So we have a digital marketing pack that we provide for companies where they can put signs on the back of toilet doors with QR codes that will take them straight. 
yeah, that's the information or scan on online, so on their intranet system. And that's why it's anonymous to encourage that engagement. And I don't think a lot of people realize that 21% of full time employees have experienced domestic abuse in their life. 21%? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's incredible. It's a fifth of the whole population. That's, yeah. That's and a lot of people, you you wouldn't think it would ever happen to them. So this is, again, really interesting um, facts that really are quite shocking and surprising, but make it very real, very real. So, yeah, it's it's important. It's important. Uh, over here in the UK, statutory guidance changed last year so that all companies are recommended now to have a domestic abuse policy. Um, okay, that's it's, great. That's a big yeah, step. I mean, it's, it's definitely making a step forward and 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 putting it on the map. But I think because people didn't know there was specific help, I think it's been very difficult to say, well, okay, well, what do we do with these people? Um, but now there's, there is help and support and the domestic abuse charities do an amazing job as well. Um, so again, there's, there's a lot of help now available. And I think it's post COVID now we've got cost of living crisis and you guys have got the election coming up. There's a lot of stress in the household. Anytime mm -hmm. there's stress in the household that aggravates divorce like breakups right. relationships but also domestic abuse so again all these things need to be considered especially when things are a bit tough out there so yeah really yeah. important services to have in your portfolio just so that if people do need it then you can provide it and you can confidently say yeah we can we can help with that and tick that box from a, an hr perspective as well as you know potentially saving lives which is really important obviously yeah, that's amazing. Wow, Sarah, I think what you do is absolutely incredible. It's so important, this work, so needed. So let us let our audience know, how can people follow you? Um, how can they find your work? If anybody listening needs to connect with a coach, um, what, are the, what, are, what are the next steps that they can take? Yeah, well, obviously feel free to, to reach out to us. Um, my website is www.saradavison.com. So that's S-A-R-A-D-A-V-I-S-O-N.com. Um, my Instagram, I, if you're going through a tough time, do check that out because we have a lot of uh, daily tips on there. Sarah Davison Divorce Coach. Um, and on my website, you'll also find the online group sessions, the one-to-one. -one. But if you want to talk to me about providing that for your business, you can always drop me an email, sarah at saradavison.com. Um, or go on the website and there's a phone number and emails available there too. That's amazing. Wonderful. Well, for anybody who's listening today, I absolutely encourage you to reach out to Sarah and her team if you need any additional support. Um, and I just thank you so, so much, my dear, for taking the time out of your day to come and share with me. It's been very enlightening for me and I hope that it is for everybody else as well. And I hope that people walk away with a couple of key takeaways from our conversation today to support themselves or somebody else that might be going through a breakup or a divorce. So oh, well, I'm a huge fan of yours, Nicole. I think what you've done and what you've achieved and created is phenomenal. So I'm just very grateful that you, you invited me on today and I've really enjoyed your amazing questions as well. So thank you for having me as your guest. Oh, thank you so much, my dear. Well, everybody, thank you so much for joining today. It's just always such a pleasure to be here and to connect with you. So I wish you all a beautiful, blessed, amazing rest of your day. And I'll look forward to seeing you all next time. Bye, everybody. Bye.